Lawns are a symbol of pride and home ownership. They're a great place to relax. Play games. And gather with friends. But when did we start growing enough of these small, high maintenance plants to make them the most irrigated crop in the country? It all began long ago, before the colonization of the United States, among European royalty. Hi, I'm Morgan Run, and I'm an interpreter here at Schmeekle Reserve. Today we're going to be taking a trip through time to learn about the history of the American lawn, how that standard has impacted native wildlife, and how we have the power to rewrite our history by taking advantage of all this unused space in our yards to benefit local ecology. So let's go! When Christopher Columbus came to the Americas, livestock ate up all the grasses and the colonizers had to import from Europe so their cows would not starve. Grasses you might be familiar with, like the Kentucky bluegrass, are actually an invasive species, not from Kentucky at all, from Western Europe and Northern Africa. At the end of the Revolutionary War, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson wanted to bring influences of European landscape architecture to our now independent country to prove our wealth and pride. These expansive lawns were purely a status symbol with no agricultural value because the only ones who could afford to maintain lawns were slave owners. This was before the invention of the lawnmower and lawns are one demanding crop. The invention of the lawnmower in combination with the growth of the suburbs after the Civil War finally popularized the lawn to the masses. Magazines were published on how to groom the perfect lawn and by having the perfect lawn, they would be model citizens. With the spread of railroads and cars, most people would be traveling through their neighborhood, so this was an important value. Along this timeline, the U.S. Department of Agriculture developed a lower maintenance grass seed mix first used on golf courses. Returning World War II vets got low-cost home loans, technologies advanced, and Theodore Roosevelt appeared on the cover of a magazine saying yard work is a soothing pastime. And now lawns are iconic symbols of the American dream. Every weekend, dads in white sneakers march in procession along their lawns, mowing an area about the size of Wisconsin and pat themselves a job well done. Oh yeah, that's good. One of the greatest threats to wildlife is habitat loss. By using your home as a nature preserve, that represents one of the last remaining chances we have to sustain plant and animal populations that were once common throughout the United States. Urban sprawl continues to grow 2 million acres per year. We are supported by ecosystems dependent on biodiversity. Biodiversity is what pollinates our crops, produces our oxygen, cleans our water, and creates our topsoil. We have planted over 40 million acres of lawn and that number is growing. We dot them with a few small non-native trees and our grasses that we use are a monocrop and also non-native. This is significant for animal and pollinator visitors that depend on these places for food and habitat. Lawns are extremely nutrient deficient. Just like we need our vitamins and minerals from the five food groups to stay healthy, animals can't survive off of just one type of grass. All animals get their energy directly or indirectly from plants. Insects are one of the most important players in the food web. They're the sole food source for many of our small mammals, the vast majority of birds, and reptiles and amphibians that in turn support the top of the food web. They also secure the entire food web by creating a constant supply of plants to eat through pollination, but we'll get to that one later. Insects have evolved alongside plants they are consuming. Every plant species protects its leaves with chemicals to deter their consumption by insects, and only a few species have evolved alongside them closely enough to develop the adaptations needed to disarm them. When we introduce plants and trees originated on a whole other continent, it's likely that the insects in Wisconsin will not be able to consume them. We used to think this was good, which makes sense. We don't want insects eating up our prized plants that we have put so much hard work into growing. But now that we know this information and recognize the importance of our yards far beyond aesthetic and leisure. 
the creatures we share the world with and depend on need food and shelter to survive. So here's how you can help this spring season. What can be done to open your home to wildlife? A great resource to use is the Wisconsin DNR's website. There you can find a page titled Wildlife in Your Land with a ton of resources linked specific to how you might want to open your home as wildlife real estate. Even modest increases in native plant cover in suburban areas can dramatically change the amount of species that are able to live in your yard. I hope to inspire both gardeners and stewards alike to save our biodiversity from extinction. And all we need to do is plant some native plants. About 74% of Wisconsin's total land area is owned by private homeowners. So if we all work together, wildlife will flourish. The term wildlife encompasses far more than the charismatic species like deer and songbirds. When you're on the market for a new place, your realtor asks many questions in order to match you with your dream home. Some people prefer cities and will choose a small apartment, while others dream of living in a farmhouse with a huge yard. Every animal has different housing needs. Getting to know your land is a little bit like getting to know a person. It takes some time and effort, but in the end, it totally pays off. So let's take a closer look at the four major components of habitat on your land. Food, water, shelter, and space. It's important to walk and observe multiple times a year to get the best idea of what plants and animals are there at different times. Wildlife find shelter for the exact same reasons that we do. They want to provide safety for their young, from the elements, and from predators. So take a look around your yard and think creatively when looking for these animals' habitats. Your yard is a whole city of standing dead trees, piles of brush, down logs, dense shrubs, and hardwoods that provide safety for a whole host of wildlife. What appears to be wild and needing maintenance to our homes is probably hosting a whole array of life. So resist the urge to clean up the wilder areas of your property. When examining your property, take into account its surroundings. What would make sense there? And what kind of habitat should you be mimicking? Consider the habitat that's already available the size, the space, the wildlife that you've already seen in your area, and what wildlife you'd like to draw in. And from there, create a plan as to what to do with your yard. Another great resource by the Wisconsin DNR is this article, So What Should I Plant? They've broken up the state into five different zones, Stevens Point being in zone four, and then again, into different types of Vines, shrubs, fruit bears, nut bears, deciduous, and evergreen trees. So when we get to the different categories, we can pick out different vines or other plants that we want to have in our yard and what zone they correlate with. For example, we're in zone four, so a great plant to grow in our yard is going to be wild grape. The wild grapes will spread under our trees, but their berries are great to be consumed by raccoons, foxes, bears, possums, skunk, and a whole host of other animals. So you can keep scrolling, and there's lots of different plants and what type of yard it'll suit, what soil, what type of sun, and what zone it fits into. From that article, I've taken notes down on what trees and shrubs would be great for our yards here in Stevens Point. The first of those being white pine. White pine are pretty iconic to the area. They're one of my favorite types of trees, and they also are the favorite trees of ospreys and eagles to nest in. Elms are great for prairie chickens and wood ducks. Oaks provide great cavities for flying squirrels to nest in, as well as other cavity dwellers. Gray dogwood provides berries in the fall that feed songbirds woodcock, pheasants, quail, and grouse. Staghorn sumac provides winter food for a lot of species, as well as we can use the berries to make things like tea. Staghorn sumac is native to this area because it grows great in our sandy soils, but it spreads rapidly, so 
Be aware of that while you're planting. Pheasants, grouse, quail, woodpeckers, blue jays, chickadees, cardinals, goldfinch, deer, rabbits, and butterflies all love to eat its berries. And finally, serviceberry is one of the earliest blooming flowers and is great habitat for some birds like thrushes, woodpeckers, waxwings, orioles, tangers, and then some mammals, so fox, squirrels, deer, and rabbits. One organism that needs our help the most are pollinators. Without pollinators, all of the Earth's ecosystems would not be able to survive, and that includes us. But what is pollination? To start, pollen is a yellow dust that carries male sex cells. Pollinators visit plants to collect nectar as food, and while doing this, they conveniently brush up against the male plant part, and the pollen sticks to them. They then carry it to the female plant part of the following plant, where seeds and fruit are produced when they're joined. Virtually all of the world's seed plants and 80% of our crops need pollinators to reproduce. From cones to lilies to corn, all of them needs a little bug to help them out. Only when flowers are visited by enough pollinators do they reproduce and produce enough seeds for dispersal and propagation, maintain genetic diversity because remember a biodiverse ecosystem is what keeps it healthy, and develop healthy enough fruits to draw in animals for dispersal. Apart from their ecological value, they provide us a service that's valued economically at over $3 trillion per year. Our lives depend on a biodiverse ecosystem, so it's important that we're supporting the keystone of that, which are pollinators. Here's some pollinators that we'll be able to find buzzing around us here in Stevens Point. The first is the rusty patched bumblebee, which is a federally endangered species. The second is a surfid fly, which is not a bee at all. It uses mimicry to look like a bee to protect itself from predators who assume it has a stinger. We have the tumbling flower beetle, a moth called the power chic skipperling, the solitary sweat bee, Carner blue butterfly, which is another federally endangered species. The black and gold bumblebee. Monarch butterflies. Ruby-throated hummingbird. And minor bees. Bees don't thrive in monocultures, especially around turf grass that isn't allowed to grow long enough to produce seed and pollen. As I stated earlier, all wildlife is in search of three things. Food, water, and shelter. I have three simple additions to make to your yard so that you can make bees' lives a little bit easier so they can continue their jobs as some of the world's hardest workers. The first thing we can do to help these pollinators make a comeback is provide them with food. Today we're going to be making some seed bombs, which is originally a Japanese technique that translates from a word that means earth dumpling. The seed bombs were created to be able to plant plants in a more efficient way, in a way that uses less pollution. The belief is that through these seed bombs, Mother Nature will decide what to sow for us and provide. I have here a bowl of some seeds that are all native Wisconsin wildflowers that are going to help out our pollinator species. Some great seeds to use are going to be bee balm, which helps the rusty patched bumblebee, which is an endangered species here in Wisconsin, milkweed, which supports monarch populations, wild geranium, which is a host plant for many moth species, which pollinate plants for us, and stiff goldenrod, which seeds in the fall support bird populations and in the summer helps out butterflies and bees. Those are all great for central Wisconsin prairie species, but if your yard is a little bit more wooded, some options for you would be to plant maidenhair ferns, trillium, and wild columbine. So to start out our seed bombs, we are going to need some higher quality dirt or compost and clay. You can use potter's clay, which you can get from the store, or if you don't have that accessible to you right now, I actually am using a cat litter, which is unscented, so the only ingredient in there is bentonite clay. And once you add water, that'll come out to a Play-Doh-like consistency. 
But what you're gonna do is take the clay, the dirt, and the seed in a ratio of three to one to one. So I'm gonna take three small handfuls of clay. One handful of dirt. And I'm gonna wix that with water. Until it's about a Play-Doh-like consistency. As you mix, the cat litter is gonna break down so it won't stay in that granular form. Granular form. One seed that's really important to plant in your mix is gonna be wild blue lupine. And that is a plant that's native to central Wisconsin because we have nice sandy soils. It's particularly important to plant those because central Wisconsin is one of the only habitat areas left for the Carner blue butterfly, which is a federally endangered species. Schmeekler Reserve actually has a project going on right now where they're planting more Carner blue butterfly habitat. So if you go to the reserve and walk around um, near the Near the oak savanna, you'll find that they're planting some plants there, and hopefully we'll be able to spot some Carner Blues soon. I have several different types of seeds in my mix is that bees, to be able to collect enough pollen, need a diversity of plants to collect it from. They won't collect as much or be able to eat as much from just one species of plant. And you can take your seed bombs and throw them in places in your garden that are a little bit harder to reach. And they can be useful for that, especially on like um, hillsides. And if you plant it on a hillside, you'll want to flatten the side of your seed bomb so that it does not roll all the way down the hill. You can also throw them in abandoned lots, just make sure they're not privately owned, or in roundabouts or other neglected areas that had planting at one point, but those plants have obviously been abandoned. So now that my mixture is a Play-Doh consistency, so it holds its shape, I'm gonna take a little bit in my hand, about the size of a golf ball, and at that point, I'm going to make a little hole in it with my thumb and sprinkle some seeds in. Now I'm going to roll it. And you can set these out to dry. Now that we have our seed bomb, as if getting our hands dirty wasn't already fun enough, the next part is to chuck it. Check again in a few weeks and hopefully you'll see a bunch of flowers growing. We've given them food, but bees get thirsty too. Making a bee bath is very simple. All you're gonna need is a shallow dish, something for the bees to land on so that they don't get their wings wet, so like rocks or marbles, and water. You're gonna fill up the dish with water, but be sure to not cover up the rocks fully. Then, set it on the ground where you see bees flying around. Now the bees have somewhere to take a bath and get a drink. So far we've done a few projects to help bees find food, find water, so our last thing we need to do is help them find shelter. There are actually a lot of solitary bee species living in Wisconsin, so that means that they don't belong to any hive. They fly by themselves and don't have a colony, so what can be great is to build them a little bee home. Some of those solitary species are the siphon fly, um, mason bees, and minor bees. So for these solitary bees, all we need is something 
to use as their home. So I'm using this old can that I had dinner out of last night, but you can also use things like water bottles, Gatorade bottles, or anything else you'll be able to put your materials in. So I have a can. The next thing you're gonna need is some sticks. And then finally, some tubes. So I'm gonna be making my tubes out of construction paper, but you can also use cardboard tubes as well. So we have our can and I'm going to measure along my paper. We wanna have about an inch of a lip on our can so that it protects the tubes from the rain. So I'm gonna measure that around and it seems like I need to cut my paper in half. So I'm gonna do that next. Solitary bee species are really important pollinators because they're actually about three times more effective at pollinating than their more charismatic fluffy bumblebee and honeybee brothers. So if you have a nice population of solitary bees in your yard, you're going to have better flowers and better vegetables because they're being pollinated more effectively. So here I have my tube and that is where the bee is going to crawl into and they can either do that to find shelter um, over winter in or have larvae. So I'm going to roll up quite a few more of these so that I can fit them all into this can. Once I've filled the can with all of the tubes, I'm gonna then poke a few sticks in there so it looks more natural, so they're more likely to come and inhabit it. It's important that you change out um, the materials that are in your solitary bee home semi, like semi-regularly so it stays nice and dry and diseases can't be spread between bees that way. Alright, now that we have it filled up with natural materials like twigs, we can tie some yarn around it and hang it somewhere in our yard that we already see bees hanging around. And it can be great to have a couple of these out all facing different directions so that they can have shelter from the wind and rain and be in the sun whatever direction it's facing in. So I'm going to wrap my string around my can. tie a little knot and I'm going to cut my string and then knot it again so it's nice and secure and then I'm going to 
tie a nice loop at the top so we can hang it from a branch. And then there we have our bee home. So let's hang it up. I noticed while we were recording this tutorial, a lot of bees flying around in my garden already. So I chose to hang it here. So I'm just gonna stick it off of this. And hopefully we'll have some bees. Proliferation of native plants from these pollinators not only provides us with abundant crops, great wildlife viewing, and a beautiful flower garden, Native plants provide us some important ecological functions behind the curtains as well. Plants are the Earth's lungs, creative in the oxygen we breathe through photosynthesis. They keep carbon in their trunks and out of our atmosphere. They purify water, keep soils in place, and prevent flooding through their roots. Spring is an awesome time to go outside and enjoy nature. Gardening can be both a rewarding and relaxing pastime, and with some plan and intention, you do not have to go far to bring wildlife to your own back doors. Thank you for listening to me today, and please post photos of your garden and all the crafts that we did today in the comments below.